Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, the self-styled Republican Party reptile, that's humorous PJ O'Rourke, on Sarah Palin's presidential ambitions. Plus, what is Israel's next move in the peace process? And then there's Money Penny herself, Samantha Bond, not James Bond, but Samantha Bond, who of course served James Bond. But we begin with Jordan. The Hashemite Kingdom has long played a pivotal role in Middle Eastern politics, and my guest today has been at the very centre of many negotiations in the region. Prince Hassan is the brother of the last King of Jordan, King Hussein, and for 34 years ruled alongside him, frequently serving as regent during his brother's absences from the country. Since 1999, his nephew Abdullah has been king, but he remains one of the Arab world's most well-known and respected figures, and he's here. Your Royal Highness, welcome. Thank you. It's very good to have you. And in addition to what I just said there, there was a phrase that I came across um, in several different places which said that you are also well known as the most intelligent royal in the world. My goodness, that's something to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Well, I think we need more wisdom than intelligence at this time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wisdom rather than intelligence. Wisdom would be more long term than intelligence, wouldn't it? Well, I think we're talking about the long term and the medium term and the West Asian region, as I like to call it. West well, Asian. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yes. And, uh, and, I mean, is the last time we, in, we did an interview, several interviews, was at the time of the Gulf War and, yes, and so on, yes. and, uh, and which, we, which we all greatly enjoyed and so on. Comparing the Middle East then and now, I mean, do you think that things have got better? or more peaceful or more progressive or has progress slowed down in the Middle East politically and so on? Uh, the uh, Mumbai based Foresight Group uh, recently produced a study called the cost of conflict and since Madrid and Oslo the total cost has been 12 trillion dollars that means oil for weapons and gas and the Middle East continues to export uh, both 70 percent and 65 uh, percent of uh, gas of oil and gas to the world. Things have not got better because there still is no regional peace process. And we talk about the peace process, but in reality, Palestinian and Israeli uh, negotiations as, uh, are, are, are slowing down, as we know. And Gershon Baskin, a very uh, observant um, peace activist, is um, really deeply concerned that uh, the Palestinians can't establish a state on 22 percent of, uh, of, of the soil that they're being offered at the present time and of course the settlements we can talk about later I'm sure. Yes, yes, well the settlements, how would you tackle the problem of the settlements? Well I, I personally believe that we need a carrying capacity concept for the whole region Yeah. because um, as far as protracted refugee situations, PRS's, uh, 80 percent of refugees are in the southern hemisphere, 16 million are registered with the uh, uh, High Commission for Refugees. And what are the settlements doing? They're basically um, pushing the two-state solution into um, uh, yesterday's um, uh, political talk. And I'm very surprised by many people who are supportive of the two-state solution until recently who suddenly start talking about the one-state solution. And, of course, you have uh, Netanyahu and many uh, of um, um, his uh, uh, supporters talking about the Jewish state. Now, a Jewish state is not going to be a democratic state. So the question is, has transfer started? I think, in a sense, it has, of Palestinian. Uh, and I would like to look at, re at refugees, displaced persons, internally displaced persons, Iraqi refugees, let's not forget, uh, in the millions, four or five million of them. Uh, Palestinian refugees all under one title, the uprooted. What do we do about the uprooted? The uprooted? Yes. You've got to bring the other elements into play, have you? Well, this is exactly what the uh, four former uh, Russian and American ambassadors to Moscow and Washington said in the Herald Tribune of yesterday. You have to reset the context of the relationship between uh, Russia and America. And quite honestly, I think these two countries are playing a role which seems to be almost excluding the rest of the Security Council. So even the Palestinians, when they say 
in August we have our options open. We go to the Security Council, we go to the General Assembly, or we go to the Special Commission on Palestine, which was created in 1949, which created the United Na Nations Relief Works Agency. All of that is very well, but the water is drying up. Euphrates, the Nile, the Tigris, the Jordan no longer exist. So I, I, I think that you can't look at security without looking at water, at people and human dignity, without looking at soft power. And you can't just look at it in terms of buying more weapons. Enormous weapons deals are not employing people in the region. They're just uh, increasing the gap, the human dignity deficit. Yes. And, uh, and Gaza, of course, is no progress there either. Well, uh, many, pe many people are saying talk to Hamas under the table, as it were, under the yes, radar. Yes. But uh, at the same time, I think that Hamas, in a sense, has offered a 20-year truce. Uh, they're not calling for uh, an immediate withdrawal. Uh, and even uh, suggestions like that, of course, are um, uh, not taken seriously. I mean, the whole idea is basically, uh, as I said, this one-state solution as opposed to the two-state solution. As far as our position is concerned, it's always been 67 boundaries and minor border rectifications on a reciprocal basis, which means that Palestinians of 48 and Palestinians of 67 presumably can make common cause in civil rights. Prime Minister Netanyahu talks about civil rights for Palestinians and national rights for Israelis. So how can you continue to, be to, uh, to call yourself a democratic state if you only give national rights to uh, um, a significant percentage of the population, but exclusively to that Israeli percentage of the population? S so that, yes, sometimes people say that people with, with a right wing or an army record or whatever um, are the best people to bring about a, a negotiation that leads to a compromise because they're trusted to be tough and so then when they're generous they are forgiven by the people who want them to be tough. Um, but in, in that sort of scenario Benjamin Netanyahu could be that, ma that man but he's unlikely to be the man for a peace most people think, don't they? Well, according to Gershon Baskin, who of course is um, uh, an Israeli speaking, and I uh, quote uh, Danny Danon, Sipi Hotaveli, Reuven Rivlin, Nir Barakat, and Be Benjamin Atina, who are acting on behalf of the Zionist movement by continuing their rapid settlement growth in the name of the Jewish people. By their own hands, and I quote, they will succeed in destroying, destroying the Zionist dream. Uh, I correct myself, he says there will continue to be a Jewish state, but no one will be able to claim it's a democratic state. And this is what worries me. Is Israel becoming one of the four strong countries in the region? Arguably, re yes. And I mean Turkey, Iran, Israel, and the United States. But does that mean that all we Arabs are completely uprooted, completely marginalized? We promoted in um, 1994, I think it was, an agreement in agreement with the United States and Israel, a Jordan Rift Valley development, for example, like the Danube Commission, to go supranational. Mm -hmm. And I think that supranational goes above the ideologues, whether Muslim ideologues, um, uh, uh, Israeli ideologues, uh, above vested interest and sticky fingers. And that's where I think we need some statesmanship coming from the international community to say, look, unless you get your act together as an economic and social council for West Asia, I mean, here are the Russians and the Americans putting together, they've already they put together a, 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 a commission, a joint commission. Why can't we have a commission that looks at uh, security, economy, and culture? Since we last talked on television and so on, um, 20 years ago, roughly, and um, of course there was the tremendous change in your life in uh, 1999 when uh, King Hussein's letter said that he was passing the succession to King Abdullah, uh, to Abdullah, King Abdullah. And uh, how, how much of a shock was that to you, or did you n guess that it was coming? Well, I mean, <laughs> no, no man lives forever, and <laughs> and and. Um, no career uh, lives forever, but mine was not a career. Um, mine was a vocation. I mean, I was studying at Oxford, and my brother said, would you take up this responsibility next to me? And um, uh, that's what I did. And I'm very happy that uh, I didn't reinvent myself, because talking of refugees, talking of human dignity, I've been involved in any number of international humanitarian commissions. So my public life continued yeah. in, in that way. 
um, the shock was his illness, of course, and, and, and the uh, dire nature of his illness and the loss of a dear friend and a dear mentor. But of course, I went to the Jordanian parliament with my nephew, the king, and wish him uh, all the very best, recognizing how difficult that uh, task is to fulfill. Yes, and so that, uh, in fact, it is indeed difficult to fulfill, uh, but as you say, you, you carried on your duties around the world and so on. I mean, um, in fact, why did, why did you think the king did send you that letter? Well, uh, I think a moment came where um, he felt um, that the younger generation had to take over, that I was a part maybe of um, uh, his generation and we worked together very closely. I remember Helmut Kohl saying possibly we were the closest uh, two figures in public life and politics he had ever seen anywhere. And so I think that he didn't want to fetter or restrain in any way the new generation who uh, now seem to be taking over in uh, many different uh, aspects of um, public responsibility, prime ministers, ministers and so forth, are much younger. But I do think that whether it's our part of the world or the rest of the world, that um, we do need the advice of people under the radar, if you will. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you've got Kissinger, Perry, Nunn, Schultz, uh, uh, the standard bearers of a moratorium on uh, weapons of mass destruction in our region. But every, every impulse comes out of Washington or Paris or London, but it's not partnered in a conversation, if you will, in a conversation with uh, people from the region. And until that happens, I don't think that... It, uh well, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Because has Jordan got a role to play at the moment? Or as you said, do they have to sit back and, and watch the proponents of the two or one state solution? carrying on the negotiations and uh, with no direct direct line to the negotiations. Well, I think that if the uh, so-called negotiations between the off and on yeah. between the yes. Israelis and the uh, Palestinians continue with the emphasis on settlements, the situation of uh, Prime Minister Fayyad and President Abbas is going to be extremely uh, difficult to, to, to maintain. I mean, they'll follow it to the bitter end and then presumably in August they'll say we've given up or before August. And so to delegitimize the uh, Palestinians means that you have to uh, consider uh, Jordan's role. In Jerusalem we definitely have uh, a role in terms of moral authority which is uh, alongside the role of all believers in the three religions. There should be a moral authority which is above uh, politics. On the question of water we definitely all the countries of the region have a role for that matter Syria and, Le and Lebanon. On the question of uh, the uprooted, again, I think that we have a role, but nobody is inviting the countries of the region to discuss these issues collectively. And so it's all bilateral relations, one-on-one, -on -one, Washington and Damascus, London and Damascus, or, or Paris and, and, and Beirut, or Washington and Amman, and so forth. And the Israelis, of course, <laughs> have it all their way. They're living comfortably behind their wall. <laughs> and, and, and this mentality, of course, is, is not going to lead to uh, peace with, with all their neighbors. On the contrary, I think it's uh, 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 tearing down walls is in, 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 and changing attitudes is what has to happen if there's going to be a stable Near East region, and this is why I think we need the conference for, for security and cooperation for what I call the West Asian region. And if there's some movement towards that or whatever, do you think it's possible there will be a so-called Middle Eastern peace or peace treaty between between the parties, two or three parties? But uh, do you think that could happen in your lifetime, or do you think peace is a miasma now? I think that um, the alternative is too horrible to contemplate. I personally am not um, interested in what happens to me, but what happens to future generations if we leave the Iranian question uh, unattended, to, if we leave the question of weapons of mass destruction from Israel to India unattended. To. I mean, here we are uh, paying attention to North Korea because they've lobbed some shells at, uh, at South Korea in our region. If you lob shell shells at somebody, you end up in all-out war. Yes. So I, I really think that the time has come um, uh, come to look at the uh, region as a region and uh, we're on the cusp. Either we'll move that way or we'll move towards further fragmentation and you see the violence in the streets of um, Iraqi cities, you see it in Somalia, in Yemen, uh, uh, ethnic sectarian violence is, is popping up its ugly head everywhere. Yes and when you start listing the places it begins to sound like a tinderbox. Exactly. And mm. it's all unraveling the state system and uh, any hope of the rule of law. Well, it's such a 
privilege and a pleasure to talk to you on this occasion. Thank you so Your much, Royal David. It's and, always uh, a pleasure. And vice versa. Thank, thank you. Here's to the next time. Well, I look forward to that. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank so. you. Well, our huge thanks there to Prince Hassan. And now, United States, she's considering running. This week, Sarah Palin, darling of many on the US right and nightmare of others, revealed that she thinks that she would beat Barack Obama if the two were to go head to head at the next presidential election. But that depends on the Republican Party choosing a candidate who is by name Sarah Palin. Now, one man who knows that party inside out is the self-styled, self-styled, that could be a jargon, I think that, Republican Party reptile, the writer, the humorous writer, the comic writer, P.J. O'Rourke, whose new book is called Don't Vote, It Just Encourages the Bastards. Anyway, he's with me right now, and the book's going very well, and you're in the middle of doing the book selling bit, right? I am. I am that, that part where uh, we were talking about this earlier. It's as though one were an automobile worker on the factory line, and then at the end of the day, said they said, "Well, you've got to wash up and put on a shirt and tie and go sell them too." Yes, you know, yes. I'm so I'm that in, in that part of it. Yeah. Well, you. And so right now, I mean, what is your thought about Sarah Palin and the Tea ah, Party yes. in terms of in each as a political force. I mean, well, I think that the Tea Party, as long as they stay vague, mm. could be very powerful. Uh, if they start getting specific, well, we all know that the devil's in the details. So if they start getting specific about their polity, as long as they have a, a, a are a kind of general force for good and scaling back the size of government, they'll do fine. Um, Sarah Palin, of course, is not the leader of the Tea Party. She's a very good cheerleader for the Tea Party, and she's gotten sort of out in front. I mean, she saw a crowd of people moving somewhere, and she ran out front in order to lead them <laughs> wherever they may go. But she, I'm very concerned about this. Um, I've long felt that uh, conservative political position, uh, or libertarian, as it would be closer to, to, to my views, is a very hard sell to the public. Because if you're an honest libertarian politician, you must go in front of the public and say, I can do less for you. In fact, in some cases, I can do nothing at all. Yeah. <laughs> now, you have to have pretty good um, 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 uh, intellectual grasp of, 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 of this, uh, of the reasons for feeling this way, and you have to have enormous charm to pull this off. Right. Reagan, of course, we know had the charm, and now, um, after he's gone, and we're reading his letters and so on, we begin to realize that he had um, intellectual depth we little suspected at the time. And what, but what about now? What about the situation well, in terms see... of, is Sarah Palin a viable candidate? No. For your I, party, if yeah. you still... Vote no, her. she exactly has that, she exactly doesn't have that charm. Exactly how not? Um, she makes people mad. Hmm. Um, um, not everybody, of course, but, uh, but too many people. Reagan didn't make people mad. People got mad at him, but he didn't make them mad. In fact, they had a terrible time keeping from being charmed by him. You know, they had to steel themselves against yeah, his yeah. charm. She makes people mad, and I see no um, intellectually, shall we say, she's carrying too much sail for her hull. I saw a quote of yours which was intrigued me very much. You said you, you, said you were in favor of seeing a return to weak leadership, which was a great slogan. What did you have in mind? Why do you want weak leadership? Um, Ed Crane, who's the head of the Cato Institute, the premier libertarian think tank in the United States, has a little talk he gives about, you know, it really shouldn't matter so much who your congressman is, who your senator is, indeed, maybe not even who your president is, as long as it's a person of good character and good, good and decent morals. Uh, because they really shouldn't have that much effect in your mm -hmm. daily life. In a free country, um, uh, these, uh, m most of the important matters in life, um, um, love and family and job and so on, really should be mostly a personal matter, not a governmental matter. And therefore, I, I would love to see us live in a world so peaceful, so free and so prosperous mm -hmm. that we didn't need strong leaders. Because they would lead us astray sooner or later. Well, that's one thing, but simply because we wouldn't have the strong problems that required strong leadership. I mean, it, much as I admire Churchill, it would be wonderful to live in a world that never needed any Churchills. Mm. 
But that's not likely either, because that means isn't, isn't. world peace is going to break out. And yeah, I can't imagine yeah. you think and that, I've been, do you? I've been waiting for that for a while. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's just sort of like the, you know, whenever I look at the at the Palestinian-Israeli situation, I think, as you know, person of Irish heritage, I said, I think, well, we 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 sorted that out. Only took us 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> but so sometimes, are you, in that sense, are you an optimist at times, or are you? Do you have to be, as a humorist and so on, uh, not, not an optimist? Well, I think as a humorist, I'm a professional pessimist. But, right, but, yeah, but absolutely, as, that's the job. But yeah. as a person, um, I, I would say there are two things that have made me very optimistic that I, I've seen in my lifetime, and, and it's China and India. I mean, uh, I, I saw enough of China when it was just unbelievably poor, enough of India when it was just unbelievably poor, to see the amazing progress that these these two, um, I wish I could say the same for sub-Saharan Africa, um, but perhaps that's next. Um, the the extraordinary change in the lives of uh, of, of of here we're, we're talking about two 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 and a half billion people or something very like that, um, close to half of the of the population that of the planet has undergone a. And then I was there in Berlin um, the weekend, not, not the night, but the weekend immediately after um, the Berlin Wall fell down, party was still going on, and that was a oh, moment. Yeah. Even mm. going back there and seeing the scenes and everything is, is, is thrilling and so It is, isn't it? Um, do you think that, that, in fact, the president will bounce back and get a second term, or do you think he's making a tactical error that will make that more difficult. A little too soon to say. I mean, we have the example of Clinton in the wake of his loss of Congress in, in, in 1994. Um, Clinton, however, was a, was a much more nimble politician um, uh, uh, than Barack Obama. Uh, and of course, part of that may have to do was, uh, with the fact that um, uh, Barack Obama may well be a rather more principled politician than, than Bill Clinton. But principles aside, Clinton both struck back at the Republicans. Uh, Republicans said, we'll close the government. And he said, fine, we'll start with the national parks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Work down from there. We'll start with the part that people like best, yeah. you know, and then second best and so on. Uh, he counterpunched very well, but then he also retreated on certain of his, um, never again did we hear anything about Hillary Care, about the health care reform that was, that was on the plate at the time. Um, does Barack Obama have this kind of political cleverness and, and also this, this, this capacity to, to compromise. I think it's a little too soon to say, but, but initial indications would be no. Mm -hmm. uh, he seems a rather stubborn, stubborn and self-convinced young man. Those me. are the initial. Well, we'll have you back to study those uh, to see how indications. Wrong often. I, how wrong I was. I, we, you know, we, I often we, won't, we won't play the bits where you were wrong. <laughs> we'll find a, a, little, a little thing at the top of the interview that shows you've been Absolutely infallible. Oh, good. Thank infallible. You. <laughs> infallible. Thank you. As someone said, the Pope saying on one occasion, I made a mistake, I am infallible, which was a <laughs> neat bit of logic. Great to have you with us. We'll take Very a break nice there with thanks to PJ. And time for that break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Samantha Bond, equally well known as Moneypenny.